Well, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Nicole Osmondson, and I am the current president of the PTO at Edison Middle School. And PTO stands for Parent Teacher Organization. Um, our vision and our goal of our PTO is to support our staff and our students, but also our parents. That's why it stands for Parent Teacher Organization. And so we had a vision tonight on how we can support parents in our community, and we felt like providing parental education uh, series these next two Thursday nights would be one way that we could do that. So tonight we're going to be talking about drug use in our community and how that affects your children and as parents how we can parent our children better. Um, so the format for tonight is that about the first hour or so we're going to have our list of panelists come up and each educate us on the effects of drugs on our children according to their profession. During that time, you were given a piece of paper if you have questions that you'd like to be answered for the question and answer period after that. Go ahead and jot those questions down and you can either just hold them up and we'll walk around and pick them up or we'll probably take about a five minute intermission between the educational portion and the question and answer and you can just hand them to my cohort and crime back there, no pun intended, um, Michelle Heath, and uh, then we'll read those questions for our panelists. I want to say a special thank you to Community Ed, who's helped us really put this together, and, and Melody and Deanne. But we have a fantastic panel, so I want to read bios of them so that you know that you are um, being spoken to with a lot of professionalism. Um, so I'm going to start with Detective Scott Nelson with the Sioux Falls Area Drug Task Force. He's been with the Sioux Falls Police Department for nearly 13 years. He's been assigned to uniform services as a patrol officer and a police training officer. He's also worked four years assigned to the street crimes unit where he conducted gang investigations. He's currently assigned to narcotics as an investigator where he's been since October of 2016. Prior to joining the Sioux Falls Police Department, he worked nearly four years as a detention deputy with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He has a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and a Master's Degree in Public Administration from the University of South Dakota. And he's previously served in the United States Army Reserve. We also have Eric Noyes. He's a family practice certified nurse practitioner who received his Master's of Science in Nursing from South Dakota State University. He works with hospitalized patients at both the medical and psychiatric hospitals here in Sioux Falls. He has certifications in trauma care, pharmacy education, and a special interest in neurocognitive development. We have with us Darcy Jensen. She's the executive director of Prairie View Prevention Services Incorporated. It's a drug and alcohol prevention agency in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She has a Bachelor of Science in Allied Health Sciences and a Master's in Human Services with an addiction emphasis. Darcy is a licensed addiction counselor certified prevention specialist, and a master addiction counselor. Darcy has over 18 years of experience as an agency director and 25 years experience in the fields of substance abuse, prevention, intervention, and treatment. Darcy started Prairie View Prevention in 1997, working under contract with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the HIDTA to provide meth prevention education around the state. Darcy is responsible for the creation of MAP South Dakota, the Methamphetamine Awareness and Prevention Project of South Dakota. Darcy has also developed prevention programs which are currently being utilized across the state in the area of school-based prevention, early intervention, and post-treatment support. And uh, we have John Haig. He's a master's level national certified counselor and licensed professional counselor. He received his undergraduate degree from St. Olaf College and graduate degree from the University of South Dakota. John has been involved in teaching and counseling in schools in various locations, including Germany, Sweden, Iceland, and Minnesota, before returning to South Dakota to accept the position of a 28-year journey as a professional school counselor at Edison Middle School. His passion has been centered around researching and understanding adolescent behavior and parenting of adolescents. He has facilitated parenting education sessions in various locations for the last 20 years. During his retirement, 
which it doesn't sound like much of a retirement. John has been teaching for the University of South Dakota in Augustana. So give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you for coming. All right. Good evening, thanks for coming. Um, again, I'm Detective Nelson. We're gonna kind of breeze through this. I've got a, a relatively short presentation. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is that we do with the task force in Sioux Falls and surrounding areas, uh, out in Lincoln County, Minnehaha County, you know, outside of the city limits. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about drugs that we see in Sioux Falls, uh, some of the trends we're seeing with the increase in uh, methamphetamine uh, use and abuse, and of course some of the different opiate dr type drugs that we're seeing in Sioux Falls, now a lot more heroin and stuff than we did uh, many years ago. And I'll try and do it very, very quickly so we can get to some of these other folks. Uh, basically, what I do, obviously, it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody, is I investigate drug-related crimes. Um, but along with that, um, guns, uh, we do liquor stings. I'm responsible for uh, dismantling clan labs for methamphetamine, uh, that kind of thing. So really our focus right now and the biggest problem we're seeing is with uh, the controlled substances, uh, methamphetamine, heroin, that kind of thing. But of course, along with those, uh, a lot of cash involved, weapons, uh, prostitution, you name it. It's not a typical day for me can be, I mean, it's, it varies, it just kind of depends. But some of the things that I do, um, draft search warrants for residences, unfortunately, and execute those warrants. So um, myself and the partners in my unit, we're the ones that do the raids on the houses. We do the investigations. Watch the houses, watch the people, follow, follow people around all hours of the night, document all this activity, put together the affidavits, present it to a judge, get it signed, and we go hit those doors. Make those arrests, interview those people, try to flip them, get them to cooperate, try to get to that next level, and then move on to the next house. It's really, it's really pretty simple. So, and of course, part of those investigations, <laughs> Doing undercover work, a lot of surveillance. I mean, it's not, I mean, you can sit and watch a house. I could spend six, eight hours sometimes sitting in one place, just watching one place, waiting for somebody to leave. So it's a, it's a lot of investment, and sometimes you may or may not get the return, unfortunately. Sometimes it's a guessing game unless you have somebody into the house, if you will. Um, liquor compliance checks, of course, alcohol with... Uh, with uh, minors, it's no surprise to anybody. We do still do monthly liquor stings. Unfortunately, every month businesses still fail those. Well, you know, each month we'll go to a different part of town. Uh, like last month, we did Northeast Sioux Falls. We checked like 30 businesses, two failed. And, and it's it's really it shouldn't happen, but it does because it's amazing. You sit there and watch this 18 or 19 year old kid go in and present his own state issued ID card which clearly shows that he's mi a minor, the person will take the card, check it, and still sell the alcohol to him. So, and of course, they get a ticket, the business gets a fine, and uh, we'll go from there. So we do controlled buys. Uh, we buy drugs from people. We pay a lot of money for drugs. Um, I've only been up in narcotics for about uh, six months now. We've actually, on one buy alone, we've spent as much as $7,000 to buy drugs, and then to watch that person drive away we use an informant to make the purchase, mainly so we can make a big federal case against this person. So they don't know it yet, but it's, it's coming. It'll be a couple more months and a few more buys, but in the end we'll get hopefully some of our money back or all of it and uh, a nice indictment. Uh, some of the training real briefly that, that I've been to or still have to go to, a uh, basic narcotics agent with a DEA, uh, clan lab school that's you know going into these labs and safely dismantling them so we don't have an explosion uh, that kind of thing uh, tactical entry schools for clan labs so you may have an active lab you may have a warrant for the house but you still have to make entry into that house and you don't know if there's weapons and that kind of thing so you have to hit these doors with all this lab gear on tanks and stuff but still doing the raid so you've got guns and that kind of thing it can be kind of complicated uh, marijuana grow investigations, uh, those are dangerous. We wear a lot of the same types of gear for uh, marijuana grows as we do for meth labs, believe it or not, because uh, this theory that it's a plant that's grown in the ground, that's a big misconception. For the vast majority of our marijuana is coming from the Colorado area. 
It's grown in a lab. It's not grown out in the fields. It's grown in a lab somewhere. They use chemicals to grow the stuff. Uh, it's just not, you know, it's not our parents' marijuana, if you will. You know, this idea of, you know, it used to be you might get 3%, 5% at the most THC out of marijuana. Now we're talking about 25%, 30%, 35% THC. It's pretty high-grade stuff, you know, very, very expensive, a lot of money involved in it. <clears throat> uh, Sioux Falls Area Drug Task Force, we fall under Haida, which is high-intensity drug traffic area. Essentially, we've got two interstates, right? 90 and 29, so we've got a drug flow and a cash flow going at least four different directions. So in my area, there's seven of us, so six investigators and a sergeant, and then a Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office deputy. Uh, we have two DCI agents, a DCI analyst, and the DCI supervisor assigned to the task force. And then we get support from the federal government, ATF, DEA, uh, U.S. Marshal Service, if necessary, that kind of thing. And basically what they do is they fund us. They pay a lot of our overtime, fortunately, because there's a lot of it. Uh, training and equipment. And that stuff's very, very expensive. It's hard for the city to come up that, you know, to send us all these schools, uh, you know, to pay for air, airlines and, and hotel rooms and stuff. But fortunately, Haida pays for a lot of that for us. Uh, these are just some statistics from a couple of years ago. Um, you know, total operations over two years for us, 722. An operation can be something as complicated as executing a search warrant or something as minor as doing what we would call like a buy bust, where we buy drugs from somebody and then we immediately bust them, that kind of thing. So 722 of those in two years. Street value of the drug seized, over $5 million. Uh, U.S. currency, nearly a million. Uh, marijuana, 350 pounds. Meth, 30 pounds. And you guys can read the rest, I guess. You know, a lot of prescription medication out there. And then 2016. So just last year alone, over 350 operations, 38 pounds of meth. The meth is the, is the big thing right now. I actually have more open methamphetamine cases than I do marijuana cases, believe it or not. Our guys on traffic stops, on patrol, they're finding meth every day. Every day you pull somebody over, you're making a meth arrest. Even more common than marijuana, believe it or not. It's so cheap and so readily available, it's just ridiculous. It's just gotten out of control. And unfortunately, and I, it's mainly because of the lack of, lack of enforcement from the courts. That Senate Bill 70 a couple years ago, I'm a firm believer. I'm not sure that did us many favors other than keeping people out of jail. The problem is they're out of jail, they're still using. And obviously it's an addiction issue. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, hiding that fact. But at the same time, a lot of these people that are on parole and that kind of thing, they're out and about running around and they're still committing crimes because nothing happens to them when they go to court. We make these arrests, they go to jail, they get released, they get rearrested, they go to jail. I mean, I've got a gal right now that's been arrested, I believe, four times in the last three months. These are all felony arrests, and, and she's still out running around. Now, obviously, she has addiction issues and needs some help. That's not in dispute, but at the same time, where's the responsibility, you know? Okay, real ble briefly, we'll uh, breeze through some of these drug uh, classes. Um, you know, as parents, you know, certain things to keep your eyes out for, in my opinion, obviously the drugs, but if you're not familiar with what they look like, you know, look for the paraphernalia, first of all, uh, pipes, packaging material, digital scales. Um, you know, a 13, 14-year-old kid probably doesn't need a mail scale or anything to weigh, you know, postage, that kind of thing. So, you know, keep your eyes out for these kind of things. You know, spoons with residue on them, syringes. Of course, you know, this is just several ways that cocaine can be ingested. Uh, most commonly, it's snorted or smoked, depending on if it's powder cocaine or crack cocaine. Uh, the packaging materials, you know, the small jeweler's bags. You know, in my 16 years in law enforcement, I've never seen anything packaged in a jeweler bag other than narcotics. Not one time have I ever stopped a car, found jeweler bags in the center council under a seat and found gold rings in there. <laughs> Or, you know, buttons, you know, a lot of buttons and stuff for your clothing come in these things. Never found it. It's always methamphetamine, marijuana, or cocaine, typically. So keep your eye out for those things. You see a bag that's got some strange-looking residue in it, give us a call. We'll deal with it. Crack cocaine. Uh, it's just a harder form made with uh, baking soda. 
uh, crack ingestion. Uh, typical, the most common one is going to be that pipe in the center uh, where they've got some Brillo pad, that kind of thing. They shove the rock in there. So if you're finding this kind of stuff in your kid's car, bedroom, wherever, please call us. Uh, don't just throw it in the trash, especially the hypodermic needles. Even if you, I understand trying to protect kids, you not want your kids to get in trouble, but if you throw something like that in the garbage, somebody gets stuck by it because it does happen. I've been stuck. I've, you know, one of my partners got stuck a couple weeks ago. So it's not very much fun having to go to the hospital and get a tetanus shot and then demand blood from the, you know, the defendant in the case and that kind of thing to make sure that you're going to be okay, you know, long term. Um, it's just some of the different ways you're going to see some of the narcotics package, but typically it's going to be the uh, Ziploc jeweler style bags or corner cut uh, sandwich bags. So if you're finding sandwich bags, for example, with the corners missing, you might want to talk to your kids. Uh, real briefly, meth, some of the street names. Uh, <clears throat> the big thing right now is people aren't calling. I mean, I don't see too much of this other than crystal maybe. What they're calling it now in Sioux Falls is dope. If you hear somebody talking about dope, they're not talking about weed. They're talking about meth. So it took me a while to get used to that because everybody knows typically marijuana, dope. Dope is meth in Sioux Falls. So uh, Most common way, smoking it in a pipe or using a syringe. Um, a lot of times, they'll use, if they can't get a pipe, they'll use a uh, light bulb. And so if you find light bulbs, you know, your regular incandescent light bulbs with the metal end twisted off, you're probably using it to smoke meth. They just drop it in there, burn the bottom of it with a lighter, and smoke it through the open end. So improvised pipe. Find a lot of those in cars and that kind of thing. Of course, long-term effects is, I mean, nobody should be surprised by any of this stuff. Damage to your organs. You know, psychological issues, brain damage, death, so a lot of overdoses, short-term effects, uh, hallucinations is a big one. But people are parent, especially the meth users, they get very, very paranoid. Uh, I've got a case right now where a young lady, well, a couple weeks ago, was arrested at uh, a Walmart here in town. She's the one that called 911. She came out of the store and said that her car was wrapped up in rubber strips. So the officers get there, talk to her. She's obviously not of right mind figure out she's got a warrant for possession. They arrest her, she's got more meth on her. Well, the rubber strip she was referring to was all the weather stripping around her doors. So she basically turned herself in. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this stuff is not uncommon. You know, especially you'll see it on the face. People will pick their faces apart. Uh, needle tracks, seeing kids with, you know, bruising in the crooks of their arms is going to be the most common area, or scar tissue, that kind of thing. How much time do I got left? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, primarily right now, in fact, in the last, I would say, f five years probably, I haven't seen any meth that was made or manufactured in a lab, like locally. So no one pot meth labs, so we're not seeing any powder methamphetamine. It's all crystal meth, it's all coming from Mexico. A Couple of reasons for that. The Mexican cartels aren't moving near as much as marijuana as they used to, because they don't, there's no money in it, nobody wants to buy it, because for a marijuana user, for the most part, it's junk. Low THC, it's no good when you can drive right over to Colorado and buy the good stuff. So our source states for marijuana, Colorado, um, California, Oregon, Washington, people are, for the most part, importing it from there, at least locally, and we're not getting near as much from Mexico. Uh, I haven't seen any, we call it Mexican pack weed, haven't seen any of that probably in a few years. It's all good lab-grown marijuana from usually from the Denver area, high dollars, that kind of thing. And the methamphetamine, it's all from Mexico, made in super labs down there. And the price of that, because they're not selling marijuana anymore, has gone way down. And that's why we're seeing so much of it. And they used to pay $120 to $150 a gram. We're getting like $60 to $80 a gram now. So it's, and they're even selling it in smaller quantities where you can buy $10 worth, $20 worth. So there's your part of your addiction problem. So your average person, maybe that couldn't afford the $120 to $150 gram 
can now go buy $20 worth. Well, that's you know not, not too difficult to come by. Steal something, run to the pawn shop, got your 20 bucks, go get your next uh, quarter gram, get you through a, you know, a couple hours at least. It's a meth lab that exploded. That's just a one pot, basically a guy making meth in a bottle like this. So we're not going to talk about labs, really. In fact, this is it. It's a whole different animal. Uh, heroin. Um, when I started, we didn't have any heroin here. Um, started seeing it a few years ago on the street, and now it's all over the place. Uh, I think we seized about 95 grams last year, and we're well on our way to surpassing that this year. And that comes with, uh, along with several problems. Uh, we're seeing a lot of overdoses. You know, people that have become dependent on different opiate drugs are being, their prescriptions are being yanked from them, and they're seeking out heroin instead. Um, we're finding uh, pills that are disguised as one thing, and all prescription pills have a stamp on them, a number and a symbol usually that you can run you know, through a, a website or in a Merck manual, something like that, and it comes back to a certain medication. But we have to test all that now because oftentimes um, it's not what it appears to be. For example, we've been seizing oxycotton. It appears to be. It looks like it has an oxy stamp on it and number. When our chemist tests it, it's fentanyl. So which fentanyl is extremely dangerous and, you know, too high a levels, you can die from it. And that's where a lot of our do overdoses are happening, not just locally, but uh, all over the country, particularly on the East Coast, a lot of overdoses because of fentanyl. So if people think they're buying heroin, they're buying fentanyl, because you can buy fentanyl on the internet. You can just order it up from China and have it shipped to your house. Just don't do that, of course. So, so <laughs> Postal Service doesn't like that. It's a federal crime, so. Uh, black tar heroin, uh, we don't see it very often in the Sioux Falls. We're pretty much seeing, seeing the powder heroin. Uh, some of the rave drugs, keep an eye out for these things. You see small colored tablet style pills that have a symbol on them. You know, anything like this could be ecstasy, MDMA, Molly, that kind of thing. Those are amphetamine based uh, pills. Uh, they get, you know, usually depending on the quality, probably 10 to $25 per pill for them in town. And we're not seeing much of this right now. It's been a couple of years since, since we've seen much of it. So occasionally we come across it, but uh, mushrooms, um, fairly popular with uh, the juvenile population. Uh, we see a couple, few labs a year uh, on mushrooms, usually growing right in the house in plastic tubs and with, uh, you know, miracle Grow and that kind of thing and some different chemicals. And so it's not unusual to come across a, a mushroom grow op operation. Uh, LSD, uh, we don't see a lot of this, but there's plenty of it out there, I guess. Uh, you know, blotter papers, you know, small squares of papers that are so soaked in this stuff. They put it on their tongue or on their eye or someplace where it's going to be absorbed through the, through the skin. Uh, huffing, uh, this is very dangerous, obviously. And this can be pretty much anything you can find in your house. Uh, model glue, uh, gasoline. Uh, some of the more common things that we see are going to be uh, spray paint. Um, as well as your dust off and that kind of thing, you know, dust off or spraying off computer keyboards. That's really popular. Uh, guys do a, on the street do a lot of DUI arrests because of dust off. So it's not uncommon for we, us to get a 911 call about a car going down the street and stopping ever so often or hitting something and then continuing on. Well, it turns out they're, they're huffing dust off because they pass out, wake up, they're fine because the high only lasts a few seconds. They move on, they hit something else kind of the same thing, and they'll have multiple empty cans of this dust off in the car. So very, very dangerous. Paint glue free on. <clears throat> now the paint around the face. A lot of our transient population, unfortunately, in Sioux Falls, they'll huff, resort to huffing gasoline or, or spray paint. Usually gold and silver are the colors of choice. Uh, some of you might have heard of these things, K2, spice, synthetic marijuana, uh, bath salts. Um, K2 is nothing more than 
uh, a plant that gets sprayed with a controlled substance, that controlled substance can be changed. Um, so we test a lot of this stuff and, and find out it's some controlled substance that was made in a lab somewhere. And, and just like getting charged with meth, you get charged with a controlled substance. So of course, marijuana is the, is the biggest one still, but methamphetamine is catching up. And I'm not going to dive too much into this, but the biggest thing with marijuana is it's high grade. And there's a lot of it and a lot of money in it. And it's very, very dangerous. Uh, the misconception is it's harmless. That's BS. Uh, we, have, we have rips, drug rips on houses that happen every week. You just don't hear about it. And these are usually young people that are selling marijuana. And uh, oftentimes it's their parents' house whose door is getting kicked in in the middle of the night. And there's four or five guys coming in with baseball bats, guns, and that kind of thing. And they're looking for the money and they're looking for the drugs because marijuana is where the money's at. The big money is in marijuana, unfortunately, because you can be hooked on it and smoke it every day, still in function, and still sell it and make a profit. Some of these other drugs, you're not going to be probably be a meth addict and be making a whole lot of money at it because you're going to be needing to steal and to support your habit. But marijuana is where the money's at. And it's very, very dangerous. A lot of our homicides involving young people the last several years, marijuana is involved. So don't don't kid yourself if you think that it's uh, a minor crime. It's not. So. That is all I have for now. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Noyes, like uh, Nicole was saying before. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've uh, worked in Sioux Falls about 19 years, predominantly with the adult population and family practice certified. We see a reasonable amount of adolescents at the Behavioral Health Hospital. So uh, my little small talk, I've got 10 slides. Uh, it gets a little boring unless you're into biology and human anatomy and those sorts of things. But it gives uh, a little bit of a direct insight into why we see some of the consequences that we do. Uh, so I'll talk about that. We talked a, uh, a little bit earlier about what scheduled drugs mean. That's just the way the government ranks drugs on how they are. Schedule one in South Dakota is uh, any drug that does not have a medical use uh, and is usually associated with a felony arrest. And then schedule two are narcotics, which I prescribe frequently. We use in the hospital. I also take care of patients that have major orthopedic surgery or trauma. So we use drugs like fentanyl, Versed, the benzodiazepines, the Xanaxes, and the pills that are out there. Uh, extremely rarely, uh, cocaine's a drug that's used in the hospital uh, for surgeries, usually of the nose or somewhere to stop bleeding because it instantly slams shut blood vessels and stops the bleeding superficially, which is how you get in trouble with your coronary arteries. That's how you get a heart attack from using cocaine. That's Richard Pryor and George Carlin all the way back to then. So most of these compounds have been around for a while, uh, and we are once we know what the actual drug is that a person has been exposed to, we can deal with the immediate consequences uh, if you overdose or you're in the hospital. Um, so that's the primary target for mood-altering substances. This is why kids take drugs either, they, they do it for different reasons than adults. That's an important thing to separate out and our counseling staff will talk a little bit about that too. Peer pressure and those things uh, impact kids differently than they do adults. Lots of adults are escaping things that have already happened to them or or treating some other mental illness with that, but that's usually not our adolescent population. Um, bad things happen when you get too much of any one thing, whether it's apple pie or potatoes or french fries, but certainly illicit drugs. Uh, very, very hard for kids to keep track of because who knows what a normal dose of marijuana is. It's not the same. So we're talking, it's not the same as what it used to be even five years ago. Uh, you can quote unquote, overdose on marijuana. There's lots and lots of publications that say, you know, there's never been a fatal death of Corey, you know, from THC that's there. Well, that may be true for that isolated compound. The hard part is you don't just buy that isolated compound straight on the street. It's who sold it to you, what else is mixed with it, where are you in that environment. You're not in a hospital room having marijuana dosed to you. You're typically exposed in a risky situation, and that's where people get hurt 
easily. Uh, kids' brains are different than adult brains. Uh, they're growing. In fact, your brains have all shrunk since you were uh, in junior high. No offense, that's just what happens as we're developing adolescence when we're small. Uh, our gray matter is building, 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 and then just about puberty, and this happens later for boys than uh, girls, we start to cut back, we pare back that brain growth and the neural network that's been there uh, and start to lay down uh, the important branches of kind of how our brain is wired, if you think of it as a computer, for the rest of life. Uh, and anybody who has teenagers at home, um, they, they uh, know that you go through mood swings, you have some disinhibition, you have a, a big change in personality. And that biology, we have a pretty good understanding of. It goes all the way from your whole brain, which fills up your head, down to the tiny microscopic neurotransmitters. And this is just a black and white neurotransmitter slide I grabbed that happens to be cocaine and where it directly works. He, he changes dopamine and uh, some of those receptors fairly quickly forever. They don't come back or shift back. Um, Back to that shrinking brain a little bit, if, if you get into this stuff at all, there's, there's actually a really good TED talk that's on the internet right now that's out there. Uh, when we're in adolescence, the hard part is that prefrontal cortex, that's our, our really thinking brain, that's how you plan ahead, that's how you say, I want to graduate, I want to make the varsity team next year, I want to finish these 20 days of treatment, those sorts of things happen in the prefrontal area. It's also when you say, whoa, this is too much fun. It's the brakes for our limbic system. And our limbic system is way down kind of underneath the bottom of the brain. And he's where you get pleasure and reward, which is I made a three-point basket. Woohoo, that's great. Uh, all of those same dopamine, five major neurotransmitters sort of generate there. And there are different things that trigger that, different drugs that specifically target that area. Uh, alcohol, not so much. Alcohol is more of a CNS depressant. I throw this one up here. So he leaves that that bottom reward center alone, but damages the brakes of the system. You start to make, you get disinhibited. Why it's the social elixir, why it's a drug that's been around for you know, centuries and centuries and thousands of years is you have that drink and you feel, oh, I'm a little more relaxed, or I might say something that I wouldn't normally say. That happens to adolescents too. That's why they use that drug. It's easy access to it. But they're still growing and paring down that brain. And we can see in binge drinking especially, which tends to happen to our junior high, senior high kids the most, uh, you get direct injury. And that's these little red squiggles that are in there, which don't seem very big. The rest of this is all healthy brain. Uh, but they're really important when you look at cognitive development and how you do with functional tasks. So memory, how are my SATs going to turn out? How are these things that are there? And we have a lot better look at that now than we even did 5, 10, 15 years ago. Both uh, UCLA, both coasts, uh, we have technology in town to use it. There's limited software we have in our MRI machines on both the blue and the green hospitals in town. But functional MRI lets you measure which parts of the brain are transmitting which chemicals at what rate. So you can get kind of a little JPEG movie of what part of your brain is working to help you solve this problem. And so you can ask questions, you can put people in scenarios, and you can see, or you can provide reward. Say, ah, oh, you can see that limbic system light up. Uh, so this is just a slide, too, that shows some of those differences. And that's alcohol, a drug we don't think about a lot. But I highlight it because it's the developing brain. So there's that, that kind of lower lizard brain way down there at the bottom. So he's the gas, and up here is the brakes. Uh, particularly hate methamphetamine, because it... Uh, lands on both of these at the same time. I see it very routinely in adults. Uh, just like our detective was saying, those aren't people who are masterminds running a drug ring. It burns through your brain really fast. It's a really small cycle of injury abuse. And then I can't quite think my way out of this anymore. I just know I need that, that next high. You still have the drive, but you lose the brakes very quickly. So you just want reward, reward at any cost that's there. Um, Another part of brain development, so we see that especially in adolescence. Those are two major areas that already have a lot of construction going on. Uh, and if you expose them to alcohol, we know it slows that down. Those kids sort of get stuck on pause. We know in not that high a dose of THC, but uh, persistent cannabis users, you may have called them stoners in high school. Um, there's a reason you do that is because you have delayed thinking. And we can show which part spatial perception how you look across a room, how you answer some specific cognitive tests that are delayed and injured. Now, the hard part, so that's, that's the functional things that we know about how 
alcohol injures that. The trick is, and this is, this is from a trial that had, um, I think 35, it wasn't Reese's monkeys, I forget the species. So these nice monkeys could develop a methamphetamine habit and they MRI'd their brain all the way through it. I don't know who gives drugs to monkeys for a living, but someone gets paid to do that as a research scientist. Uh, and we can show variability even within a small group of 30 that not everybody's brain, and those are primate brains, those are the closest you can get, um, not everybody gets the same amount of injury to your brain. Also, and we know this from actual human studies, again, not MRI study, because this is about 20-year-old, 15-year-old data now, but testing data on how you do on memory and recall, we know that people recover differently. If you stop using marijuana for a month or three months, uh, we see people's scores on those tests improve, but different people at different rates. So there's a lot of question about how do you treat that, number one. That's way out there because we know we have counseling, we know addiction uh, comes from that limbic system, from that drive for reward, comes from social pressure. Again, adolescents are different than adults specifically because of the mechanics of how their brain is wired or is trying to wire itself to grow up. Um, and then we know the direct effects. We have a pretty good idea of which drug injures which part of the brain, but we don't know who is most at risk for it. So maybe some of that's genetic, that's family history, that you're exposed to this toxin and your brain cells develop in response to it this way. We also know that pressure from the outside social structure uh, scenario you're in uh, affects directly how that physical shape of the brain develops too. So people who were through the potato famine, people who are starving or are refugees who are under those kind of extreme psychological and physical stresses at the same time also show different changes in those same structures, but much more resilience than a drug injury that starts to look more like a trauma, like my brain is directly injured. Or huffing is really brain trauma as opposed to brain receptor changing, because that's just anoxia. You're strangling your brain. You starve the, all the cells about the same time from oxygen. So it, uh, also a really lousy habit or a way to seek a very short, short high, but very inexpensive. So we don't know right now, there's no good DNA test to say, oh, this kid's really at risk, don't let him have any marijuana. I don't know if that would help how you parent or not anyway, but we, uh, as we advance that, the hard molecular science, uh, that does help us on the medical field now, where I'm at, we select narcotics based on people's uh, profile of how their liver processes the drug. Because I know one drug will likely not work as well at all to control pain for one person uh, as the next one can. So the, the hard science of how your body processes specific pure chemical has come a long ways. How we apply that to addiction uh, is coming behind it. And then when you look at adolescent behavior, that risk taking, we know teenagers take a lot more risks than third graders do. I mean, they're not scared of jumping off things but you can't talk them into doing really wild things out there like maybe your 14-year-old friends could when you were there. And again, that's that frontal cortex, that's that breaks to the limbic system to say, well, I don't wanna take this risk, it's too much. Um, that that developing brain we know uh, is a really critical time period. It's associated with long-term rates of depression, long-term rates of mental health issues. Uh, again, hard to sort out because were you prone to being depressed or was your marijuana habit in junior high the thing that always upset your chemistry and now you're really going to be? Uh, so it's a little of column A and column B. But uh, a lot of accumulated physiologic, meaning brain mapping data, that is already there. And that's the special thing when we get into legalized marijuana. May it be for pain control or glaucoma or all that. Those are adult theories not well studied and dosed indications. Minnesota as a state uh, has really kind of done some smart things to say how do we dose this drug, let alone how do we control it, but what are the real effects of it? What would it be just like any pharmaceutical grade drug uh, undergoes? Um, but for adolescents, again, not studied at all well because you don't intentionally, we know it injures brains. Um, not studied well at all to look at those long-term consequences where if we expose you to this, whereas uh, the medical version of fentanyl, uh, which we've had around for years and years, a very potent narcotic, uh, easy to overdose in the hospital on my floor with nurses at the bedside and machines hooked to your finger. We overdose maybe one out of 100 people. We can just turn the dose down and they wake up and start breathing better on their own. Or we give them oxygen 
or I can pull the antidote out of the drawer in the hallway and reverse it quickly. That's Narcan or Naloxone. Um, but that's, that's your anesthesiologist, your nurse practitioner, and your nurse at the bedside all getting it wrong with a nice syringe that's measured up. So when you're an adolescent exposed to that, um, it's very easy to get it wrong in a fatal scenario without all those backup and support to it. But they just the exact same clean drug that wherever you got it sold to, let alone the high exponentially R fentanyl, some of the things that get mixed in from China, plus whoever mixed whatever secondary thing that was with it. We just really hate seeing that. It's very, very potent. The narcotics are there can just be off by a millimeter is all that takes. So those are some of the things that we look at, but especially uh, important to keep track of what it means to be an adolescent and what recreational drugs. There are really no recreational drugs for adolescents. If you're 12 and in the hospital, I do everything I can not to expose you to fentanyl or said the brand name controlled substances because we know that they work differently, that they can have long-term consequences on a, a healing and growing brain. So uh, we definitely don't want people to just try them because they're there. So I'll be able to answer questions a little bit later to specific medical issues that you can think of as they come up. Otherwise, I'll let us keep going with our next speakers. Good evening. I do not have a PowerPoint. I thought there was enough information that if I tried to put it all in a PowerPoint, we'd be here a long time. And I feel like our goal is to get some questions answered, so hopefully we can do that. As I was introduced, I'm Darcy Jensen. I'm the Executive Director of Prairie View Prevention Services. I've worked in the drug and alcohol field for many years. As she was reading, Nicole was reading, I thought, okay, I'm the old one on the panel. But that's okay. Being a grandma is just fine with me. Our agency, Prairie View, has worked in the Sioux Falls area. We work in the schools. That would include the Sioux Falls schools, the Catholic schools. We also work with kids in Harrisburg, Canton, Lenox, T, so any Lincoln or Minnehaha County school. So when I talk about the kids or my kids, it's a lot of kids. It's not just Edison or just one middle school. Our funding comes from the state, from the State Division of Drug and Alcohol and Behavioral Health out of DSS. We currently get some funding from the city and that's always a year-to-year -year basis. And the Sioux Falls School District allows us to be in their building and offers us office space, use of computer. And so we have that opportunity then to see kids right in school instead of you having to make an appointment and get them someplace else, which is one thing I think is helpful when we're trying to work with kids and drug alcohol issues. So what are the things we're seeing? My staff works with the kids and I read the charts and work with those kids also. I would say the drug of choice in the southeast part of the state is marijuana. By far, that is the drug we see the most used and the one that brings the kids to see us because they've gotten in trouble with marijuana. I would say second would be alcohol, and that's always kind of a secondary drug. What I mean by that is oftentimes kids might be drinking and then somebody says, why don't you try this? or they start out with just alcohol and then somebody brings the meth, somebody brings the heroin, somebody brings the other prescriptions. So we see alcohol as a joining drug oftentimes, and it's a drug that's at the parties, but it's not necessarily the only thing being used. We've really, as a state, done a pretty good job of starting to bring down our alcohol use rate among kids. When I first started, our state had one of the lovely, we were number one. We had 98% of our high school seniors said they had drank alcohol by the time they graduated. We are now down into the 60 percentile as a state. So we've made progress, but that's still not a good thing to know that many kids have been drinking by the time they reach senior high school or graduate. I would say after that, we're really seeing a lot of prescription drugs. And it, they're not fussy, as long as it's a prescription, most of the time it's gonna be an opioid, a painkiller. That's what they're looking for, but they certainly will try other things. I just did a presentation last weekend and asked somebody if they knew what lean was. And it's not because you've all been on a diet. Lean is when you're using cough syrup with codeine and you typically mix it with a light colored soda, so that'd be like a 7-Up Fresca, 
Sometimes kids will put like a Jolly Rancher in to take the taste down, but otherwise they're pouring a good half of the bottle, maybe between two, three drinks. What's really dangerous besides drinking the cough syrup with codeine is that oftentimes once the cough syrup's gone, they switch to alcohol. So now we got two depressants. They, so we're stack, it's really stacking. And so we're seeing that body trying to get rid of the cough syrup with codeine, and it takes your body a while. Your liver's got to get that all out of your system. And then on top of that, they're putting the alcohol. So we see kids really get into trouble fast. If you go to Purple Drank, Lean, Google that, and you'll find there's a whole culture. There's T-shirts you could get. It's a lot of the rappers will use um, those terms in their songs. So if you listen, you'll hear that. That might be a, a slang term that you want to kind of take a little look at. Xanax is right now. I think of the charts that have come through my office the last two weeks. Xanax has probably been one of the high points of, yes, I, how many bars am I using? And by bars, if you look at a Xanax tablet, you'll see that there's lines, and they'll cut so they can measure, so-called measure, how many bars they're using, how much they're using. In addition to that, we are seeing our kids using meth, and we are seeing some of our kids using heroin. And as I said earlier, I'm the old one. I used to see heroin when I was working the Federal Bureau of Prison clients. Prior to that, it was with detox and working with some of the US attorney. I've worked all nine reservations, but that was years ago. And now we're seeing it here, and we're seeing it with kids. So we are seeing the heroin and the meth here. Oftentimes, parents are also using. And so that's why the kids are getting it or, or can get it as easy or relatively easy because it's in the home already. And so it's something that we're seeing them use. I would say, and the other speakers talked about the over-the-counters and our inhalants. And when we look at OTCs or over-the-counters, those are often things that we see the middle school or our fourth, fifth graders use because they're easier to get. If I'm in high school, I can probably get a prescription drug or figure out how to get a prescription drug pretty easily. But if I'm a middle school or a fourth or fifth grader, then I probably am not going to be as savvy. Not that we don't have some savvy kids, but they are the ones that usually are with the OTCs or the inhalants. And when we look at um, over-the-counter, we oftentimes see that as something that's being shoplifted. But I would certainly monitor what you have in your cupboards and your medicine cabinets and those places. And when we look at inhalants, I think the, one of the things that we see often with boys is the Axe deodorant, that spray, that Axe spray. So if suddenly your kid, you might think, oh, yay. They're fine. I had three boys, so I know that, I know that adolescent and pre-adolescent kind of, you might go, great, they're using deodorant. I'm so excited. And that could be true. That could be, it could be very innocent. But if it's all the time and it's like wherever they are or if you go out in their room and it's like, wow, he's gone through three cans, and I'm guessing there's some huffing going on. So think about what's been going on in your household or how have things changed if there has been some changes. When we look at the meth, and I was going to mention, our youth risk behavior surveys, which are done every two years, and those are done through ninth through 12th graders, and they do it across the United States. South Dakota has their own youth risk behavior survey. When we looked at the ninth graders in particular for South Dakota, we had ninth grade boys saying they used meth at 4.8, almost 5% of the kids said they, they had used meth in South Dakota. The national rate for ninth graders is 2.9. So we're, we're double. When we think about that, that's scary. When we look at our rates of use for heroin, and we compare South Dakota and the US we are looking at, if my bifocals work well, uh, in South Dakota we had 2.9, almost 3% of our kids who said they had used heroin. So when we look at that, you might think, well, not in South Dakota or not in Sioux Falls. And it doesn't mean we don't have a, a good community. It means we just need to be wise about what we're doing and asking our kids questions. 
when I'm done, I have brochures that I brought on some of the synthetic drugs, on the meth, and it's a few other, other drugs, and I'll put them in the back. The other thing that our agency does is our parents matter, and maybe you've heard recently the you know, don't want to get the knock on the door. Sheriff Milstead is doing our radio spot here. I would encourage you to go to our Safe South Dakota website. It has information for you as a parent. How do I make contact? How do I talk to my kids? What do I do? And I'll have some of the brochures and talking points back there, which has the website on. So you can write it down if you want, but it'll be in the back. And really knowing that parents need to, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not a one time. Now I've had that conversation, oh great. Now I can go on to something else. You need to get comfortable with it and have it often. It's just like when your kids were learning to cross the street. You didn't tell them once or walk them once across the street and say, okay, now you know how to do this, I'm done. No, you, you continue to do that until they were old enough to drive and then you were with them when they were first driving. You need to be that comfortable with them in talking about drugs. I sometimes have parents say, well, I'm not gonna talk about it because I'm afraid then they'll use or they'll, they'll be curious. I'm here to tell you there are already enough people in their life talking about it and giving them other information. Wouldn't you rather be the person giving them that information if you think, I don't really know, get online and look. Go to some of the government websites, some of the trusted websites, and look at the information so that you can have that conversation. And it should be a conversation, not a lecture. Because if you begin to lecture, what happens? <laughs> All of you that are parents, they're, yeah, it, they're gone. And so you need to make it a conversation. If something comes on the news when there's been a celebrity that's overdosed or there's been a car crash, what do you think happened? What would happen if that were your friends? Do you think anybody in your school has ever done that? Start to ask those questions and listen. Listen for what those answers are. That's the important part, is really listening because that will give you clues on what you might need to be doing as a parent. The drugs and alcohol are here and they've been here for a long time but it's how we deal with them as a parent, as a grandparent, as a community, as a school, that makes a difference. We do see kids successfully go through our prevention programs at Prairie View because we offer not only the screening and the assessment, but we also do prevention groups at different levels or we help you get your child to treatment. We don't do the treatment, but we help you in knowing what are the better treatment for you. If you want something faith-based, here you, Here's who you could go to. If you want something out of town, out of state, here's what you could do. But what we need to know is that you're getting services and you're getting something that is valuable for you and your son or daughter. I am going to quit talking so John has an opportunity to talk and I'll certainly take questions when it's time for that. Thank you. Darcy, believe me, you're not the oldest one here. Well, Nicole said that I have been researching, studying adolescent behavior and parenting of adolescents for 20 to 25 years. I've taught adolescent development at Augie on different occasions. I still don't know about adolescent behavior <laughs> <laughs> or how to parent the adolescents. Um, I had a professor once when I was taking a parenting class who told me as parents, we're trying to stack the odds in our favor because fantastic parenting can produce some very uh, dysfunctional kids and absolutely dysfunctional parenting can produce some absolutely wonderful kids. What we want to do is try to stack the odds in our favor. 
So I'm going to do something with you tonight. I'm going to get you involved, I hope. Um, I always got to have humor. Whenever I have my presentations, I have a little humor. And what I'm going to talk about tonight usually takes me an hour, but I'm going to try and get it in 15 minutes. So when I was a boy of 14, my mother or my father was so ignorant they could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. <laughs> Before I got married, I had three theories about bringing up children. Now I have three children and no theories. <laughs> Children in a family are like flowers in a, in a bouquet. There's always one determined to face the opposite direction from the way the arranger desires. This one maybe is not so humorous, but it's, it's, I'm going to pick it up later. Nothing speaks more loudly to a child than a good parent's quiet example. So it's time to talk. And I'm going to share with you a survey that was taken by Hazelden Rehab Center in Minneapolis. Now this survey is a little dated, but it still has relevance for today. And um, I usually give this out as a quiz to all the parents that are in, my, in the audience, but we don't have time. So they surveyed over 30,000 kids in this area. The goal was to examine the influence of you, family and parents, the school, the leisure time, and religious variables on the magnitude and severity of drug use among adolescents. So what we're going to do, what makes a difference? I'm going to show you some groups of young people. You are to, to think, is, is that group less or more or about the same uh, as far as using drugs as the average youth? I don't know what the average youth is, but that was, that was part of the survey. You know that all surveys are not 100% accurate, just like our, our last election. OK, are young people involved in musical activities more or less or about the same to use drugs? Anybody want to throw out an answer? You say less? OK. Same. Are young people act oops, the answer I got. <laughs> Are young people active in religious youth groups less, more, or the same? Well, the answer is already up there. Young people from single parent families, are they more apt to use drugs, less apt, or about the about the same? More? When I took this survey myself, this quiz, I said more too. Um, same. Young people who say that their parents would be upset if they knew he or she was using. More or less are the same as the average kid. Same? Less. Young people involved in athletics. More or the same or less. I hear people mumbling. I can't hear you. <laughs> More different answers. The same. Now, as I said, this, this survey was given a few years ago, and I think this may have changed now because of the use right now of steroids with our young athletes and with performance-enhancing performance drugs that are becoming so widely used in our culture with our obsession with sports and so forth and athletics. So that one may have changed since this was given. Young people who spend many evenings a week out for fun. More? Young people who work for pay. Less? Pay? More? More? Less? <laughs> the answer is the same. Young people with clear educational goals. They know where they want to go to college. They know what they want to do. Less. Get that one. Young people who report being comfortable when talking with their parents. Darcy mentioned this, some of this. The same. Young people with a larger than average amount of spending money. More. 
Young people who value religion as important. Obviously, that's less. Young people with highly educated parents. You would, well, it's the same. It doesn't make any difference the economic level of the parent. It's the same. Okay, you have told me, or I guess I've gotten out of you, that these are the two that kids would most likely use drugs. The young people who spend many evenings a week out for fun and young people with a larger than average amount of spending money. Which of those two do you think is the most likely to use drugs? According to the survey of 30,000 kids. First one? First one's correct. Young people who spend many evenings a week out for fun are the ones that are most likely to use drugs, followed by this, the second one. So we have said that these are the ones, kids, that are least likely to use drugs. Which one is the one that is most least likely to use drugs? Education goals over here. Anybody else want to take a stab? The parent one? Uh, young people who say their parents would be upset if they knew he or she was using? Well, how do you know that? <laughs> That's right. That's the one. I'm surveying the, the third one. Young people who say that their parents would be upset if they knew he or she was using. Okay? So what the survey come up with, came up with was what parents say and do about drug use is more important than any other single variable. That's you guys. I'm through parenting. <laughs> Parental messages of concern must begin, as Darcy said, early and be in re reinforced regularly throughout middle and senior high school. You can't start it as a 12th grader and having the talk. I have a, a little bit, I'm a little bit uncomfortable on when we talk about the talk because the talk to me implies it's one way. I'm, so I don't like that word, the talk, because as parents, I think we need to listen as much as we talk. So when I hear the PSAs or the TV and so forth and it says, have the talk with your kids, it means, is it okay then that we just talk and lecture like, like Darcy said we shouldn't? So number one, what can we do as parents? Nothing speaks more loudly to a child than a good parent's quiet example, which is what I had in one of the first slides. How do we use drugs? Over-the-counter drugs? Whatever. Our, our kids are like sponges, and they are looking at us as role models, especially if they're early middle school, late elementary, and they are seeing what you do. So how do we use drugs? How do we use alcohol in our home? And kids pick up on that. So number one is being a good example. Number two, the talk. Here are two ways that we can have the talk. Number one, if you ever use drugs, I will punish you. You'll be mincemeat. Or I would be so upset if I ever found out that you were using drugs. Which of those is more effective? I think you are th thinking right, the second one. The first one, however, is, comes from maybe autocratic type of parenting where it's do as I say, and you kind of say, okay, kid, if you're going to use drugs, you're gonna be punished, and you wash your hands, and they think you've had the talk. Kids tend to rebel against a parent's values. Keep that in mind. Kids tend to rebel against a parent's values. If you always nag about something, they, if they're going to rebel, are going to rebel against that value. And we hope our kids, adolescents, all rebel. Because that's, that's how they become with their own self-identity, is to break away and some, in some ways rebel against us as the adults. 
So it's healthy. But if you're going to nag about something, my father nagged at me every single day about, if you ever use cigarettes, I'll punish you. Guess what I did to rebel? Smoke cigarettes, all right? So this also means that we don't, as adults, like to be told what not to do, right? It's a natural thing. How many of us have radar detectors in our car or are used to? <laughs> no highway patrol is going to tell me I can only drive 80 miles an hour. <laughs> Kids pick up on that. I work out a lot at the Y. The Y is on the east side of Minnesota Avenue. Right across the street is the free parking lot on um, Minnesota Avenue, in the middle of the block. I have seen one family go down to the street light to cross the street. Here are all these parents taking their kids through this busy traffic across this busy Minnesota Avenue because nobody's going to tell me to go down to the stoplight. Parents pick up, our kids pick up on that. <laughs> so I would be upset if I ever found out that you were using drugs is a good way to start the talk. But, as Darcy said, you can't start it in 12th grade. And this approach decreases in importance as the kid gets older. By 11th and 12th grade, it probably has no impact. All right? But in the middle level and probably late elementary level, it has a whole lot of influence on kids. Because, you may not believe this, but middle school kids and late ele elementary kids, you are still the most important person in that kid's life. They may tell you differently, but they're still trying to please you. And if you say that you're going to be upset, uh, if you ever caught them or found out that they were using drugs, it's, it, you want to stack the odds in your favor. This approach, psychologically, works better than the first approach. If you ever use drugs, I will punish you. If you're going to use that approach, and maybe your kid will um, be okay with that. I, I, you know, when we talk about psychology, there are always exceptions. But the odds are it's not going to work. And I know we probably have a few autocratic parents in here, and that's your style. And I know it's going to hard, be hard to break it. And I know you're saying, John, this is really a soft approach. I would be upset if I ever found out that you were using drugs in that kind of a soft approach to this. It isn't if you continue to have the, the talk and listen. And as Darcy pointed out, you have to ask the right questions. And that's so important. So, I wanted to show one more thing. <laughs> I'm also a firm believer in the use of contracts. And I don't know who this guy is up there, but I happen to get a copy of his contract. When you are dealing with life and death issues, a contract is so important with adolescents. I know that adolescents may not know the value of a contract. You know, if they sign their name to it, a lot of adults don't either. But um, a contract, number one, it puts it in writing. And as a therapist with kids for many years, the, I know the more you as a parent can put things in writing, especially with middle school kids and up, the more effective it is because they're always going to come back to haunt you with, you didn't say that, or I didn't understand it that way. But if you have it written out, they both sign it, have it someplace where maybe they can even see it, or at least come back to it and talk about it every month or whatever, it's in writing. And usually it spells out in detail 
what the consequence is. So you don't have to argue about the consequences of some of their behaviors. This is what's going to happen. And ask the kid, what are some ideas you have for consequences if I caught you using drugs? Kids come up with some good ones. So anyway, the use of contracts, if at all possible. I don't like this one too well, um, because it says in the first sentence up here, this means that driving privileges may be revoked due to an infraction of the following rules. I don't know what he means by being revoked. Is it for how long? So you got to put stuff, stuff in detail. One, two, three, four, five. Sit down with your kid and have him or her also put input into that contract. So it's a joint contract with, with both of you. OK, I'm done. I want you all going tonight and write a contract. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we'll take about three, four minutes of a, just a, a break. If you have questions, go ahead and write those down. You can hand them to myself or Michelle in the back, and then we'll finish with our question answer period. So, thanks.
Okay, we have awesome questions here for our panel. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the question, and then our panel will go ahead and answer if they feel like it's their area of exp expertise or if we want more than one to answer the same question. So that would be great. So I'm going to start out with the first question, which is, should we tell our kids about our own past use of drugs and alcohol? And if yes, how detailed should we be? Good question, right? Yeah. I see you're all jumping at that one. I will be the brave soul and, and jump in. My answer to that, and we actually, on our Parents Matter website, our Safe South Dakota website, do address that issue. And on the website and what we tell parents is that we need to be honest with our kids, but we don't necessarily need to be detailed. And what you can all often do is if there was a time and many people who have used either alcohol or drugs would say, I remember, and we were, Eric and I were just talking about people who drink and it's, well, they throw up in their shoes or they get very sick or something happens that's very negative. And it can, it can be something as simple as, yes, your mom drank or yes, your dad drank or yes, I smoked pot or fill in the blank, the drug or alcohol, and I really regret that. And part of why I regret that, or, if, or maybe you didn't regret it, but you had some incident that happened. I wished I hadn't because I was arrested. I really disappointed my parents, or I got really sick. I lost a lot of friends. I failed my chemistry test. Whatever incident, because if you've experienced drug and alcohol use, you've probably also experienced a negative effect. And it's bringing that back and explaining what you learned, why you wished you hadn't done it, or what it cost you. And I think being honest about that consequence is often the, the learning, the lesson that you can teach, and saying it was a mistake I made, and here's why I believe it was a mistake. And I learned from that, and as your parent, I love you and I would prefer you not to have to make the mistakes I made. And that's how, when we're working with a family or when we're talking about sharing that information, would I encourage a parent to talk about long-time use or the fact that they were IV using or those kinds of things? No, I, it's not as important to be cleanse my soul kind of conversation as it is to be honest and talk about the negative consequence though and why you, why you hope your son or daughter wouldn't have to go through that same kind of negative impact. Okay, next question. We talked a lot about the types of drugs kids are using and not a lot about the age group and or where it is happening. Does the actual use happen at school? Is it in a home where kids are unsupervised? or more in public places? Well, from a law enforcement standpoint, especially my you know, time working the streets on patrol, uh, generally <clears throat> when I would encounter you know, kids in that middle school age or in high school, typically it's out in public places. Uh, parks, parking lots at department stores, that kind of thing. Um, driving around in cars, if you will. Those kind of places generally is where we would encounter it. So really, probably not that much different than, than adults necessarily. However, you know, unless they have you know, another residence to go to where the parents maybe aren't around or work overnights or unfortunately in some cases just don't care, you know, they may do, do it at a buddy's house, that kind of thing. But typically it's going to be out in public places when they're mobile generally, cars, that kind of thing. I, I would agree with that, but I'd also say we are hearing of kids that use in homes, and I would encourage parents to not only know who your son or daughter's friend is, but know who the parents are or where that home is. Know their last name. When we were working on our Parents Matter campaign, we always bring in a focus group to talk about what do we need to be looking at for this year's campaign when we're putting out that information. And a couple of law enforcement officers that I were, was working with talked about a father calling law enforcement saying his son was in trouble and he was at a house party, but he didn't know the last name. 
he couldn't figure out where his son was. And that seems very odd, but when our kids get older, oftentimes they may have multiple friends or they begin to change friends if they begin to use substances. And making sure, be that it's okay to be a bad parent, as what your kids might say is a bad parent. Ask the questions. Where are you? Who are you going with? What are you going to be doing? What time are you coming home? My sons loved me for those things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In seriousness, though, you do need to do that. This year, the youngest children we've been working with are age 11. So we're seeing kids, I would say the average age of first use in South Dakota is about 13. I'm going to put a, a plug in here for the um, what we do after school. Because in the survey that I just described with you or went over with you, um, kids who are unsupervised are the kids that are tend to be, get into, into drug use. Well, we have a huge amount of families in South Dakota who are single parent, and we also have a huge amount of parents in South Dakota who both work. And so after school, there is this thing about being unsupervised. Um, and that's a dangerous time for kids. And not all of us can afford to send our kids into, into gymnastics and soccer and all those kind of things. So I belong, I'm a member of the South Dakota After School Network. And it's a network that tries to encourage, to promote um, after school programs. And if you cannot be home, it's so vitally important that you get your kids into after school programs. And they have them in our schools. The y YMCA has them in our schools. I think there is a cost if you can afford it. But there are other outlets out there where you can keep your kids supervised if you're not at home. Now at night, that's a different matter. But hopefully you're home at night. But after school, those hours right after school are crucial if kids have no supervision at home. What over-the-counter drugs should be most carefully monitored and which ones are most often misused? What we're seeing is Robitussin, so robo-tripping, is what they would be talking about. We also see coracidin. They call it triple C, where they're taking coracidin. The other one that we see is Mucinex. And in fact, with Mucinex, there's a couple websites that you can go to that actually tell you how many boxes of pills or how many pills you need to take to feel certain way. You know, when do I have hallucinations? When do I kind of going through that list? So it's being familiar with some of those kinds of things, those would be probably the three I would say would be the most often misused, especially with the ones that are in the little bubble packs or strip packs that they can pop them out because they can easily go in and shoplift and pop them out if they're... The dollar stores, not any one certain dollar store, but dollar stores oftentimes don't have things behind the counter or on end racks like a Lewis Drug or a Target or someplace that does more monitoring. So in the dollar stores, it's much easier for kids. At least I've seen kids do that. And kids that we're doing our screenings and assessments with will say, well, I can get them there because I can easily go in and pop them out because then they leave the package there and all they take is the pills. Okay, Are big city gangs coming here to recruit young teens? Well, I used to work gangs in Sioux Falls, uh, you know, just real quick numbers wise, we've probably got about uh, 38 identified gangs in Sioux Falls, about 450 gang members, give or take, it's a fluid number, of course. Uh, we've got groups, you know, represented from just about every major street gang in the country. When I say major gangs, I'm talking about the ones you typically, you know, see on TV, Gangster Disciples, Bloods, Crips, uh, Latin Kings, groups like that. They're all here just in varying, varying degrees of numbers. Now, fortunately, in most cases, they're, they're what we would call hybrid gangs. So essentially, they're, they're homegrown South Dakota gangs, whether they're from 
uh, the Sioux Falls area or maybe from one of the reservations. And what they've done is they've taken on the identity or the names of these larger national groups. They're using their colors, they're using their symbols, they're using their tattoos, but they have no direct association to the group's home base. I'll use an example here in Sioux Falls. By far, our biggest street gang is the Gangster Disciples. Well, they're originally based out of Chicago. We've got a handful of guys that are Gangster Disciples from the Chicago area, but they're not essentially running the, these local uh, adolescents that are, that are involved. However, having said that, um, you know, you hear the term wannabe, it doesn't make a bit of difference. If you claim to be a gang member, you're dressing like a gang member, you're hanging out with other people that claim to be gang members, you're acting like a gang member, then you are a gang member. An example I, I, I use, and I, I don't like to use it, but it's, it's very glaring, and most of you probably remember this, uh, Rapid City, a few years back, uh, two young street crimes unit officers and a, and a third officer uh, were shot and killed. Where two of them were killed and one was wounded. Uh, that was a South Dakota gang member. He was a gangster disciple. So if anybody thinks for one second he's a wannabe, you're wrong. There's probably too not, not too many gang members running around the streets in the bigger cities, uh, you know, whether it be Detroit or Cleveland or Miami, that can say they've tilled, killed two police officers. But this kid did. And he, was, he grew up right here in South Dakota. So it doesn't make a bit of difference if you're from here claiming to be associated with one of these bigger groups. doesn't matter at all. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, the second part of that question is, is there a website or resource where we can find terms used for drugs, drinking parties, different things like that, and gang-related terms so when we overhear things at home, we can look it up? Uh, there's a lot of different ones out there. Um, you can pretty much Google about anything and punch in there. Uh, Urban Dictionary, um, just to punch in drug slang, that kind of thing. You'll get a million different... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, lists of things to look at so you can learn what some of the terminology I mean there, there's so much I don't I I can't begin to it's like a second language you know I, I know some of it but there's plenty of it I've never heard before you know when I'm interviewing people I have to ask them I have to stop sometimes and ask them what they're talking about because I'm not sure but that's how you learn you ask so how do we decide if we should do room searches and or drug tests on our children um, and if the child has already been caught several times, does that make a difference? Well, as far as, this is just my opinion. As far as searching a kid's room, if you believe they're using, it's your house. I mean, it's not theirs. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be that, uh, you know, the, the hardliner. And, but it's your house. You're in charge. They're the kid. You're the parent. Be the parent. If you think they're using, then go through their stuff. Go through their car, that kind of thing. If you find something, you handle it how you think you should handle it, whether it's indirectly with them or if you feel like we need to be involved. If you're not sure, you know, I want to, I want to call in and, and be anonymous. We could have a conversation, that kind of thing. But it's your home. It's your property. You know, remember this. If we're there for some reason, unrelated, and we see something and it's not yours, Unfortunately, depending on the circumstances, you know, the, the, the person that uh, isn't really responsible or other people could end up being responsible for that. It's just like if your child's driving around in a car with the wrong crowd, maybe that car gets pulled over for a traffic violation, there's four or five kids in there, and we see somebody stashing something or we can smell something and we search that car, and maybe that item belongs to one person in that vehicle, but nobody is owning up to it, what's going to happen is everybody's going to get arrested. Is that fair? Probably not. But at the same time, people can talk, too. And if you're going to refuse to explain to us who hid that item in the center council, well, what choice do we have? Because we've, we've got to take some action. We can't just let everybody walk away. So, does that make sense? So... Your house, you make the decisions. I'd like to add to that because I, I agree to that. However, when we have the talk with our kids, I think you have to spell that out as a consequence. Don't wait until you, something happens and then go search the room. But when, if, I, 
see or if I think you're using drugs, it's my right as a parent to search your room so that they know ahead of time that that's your right. You can even write it down and tape it on the wall if you want. But yes, I think searches are important. I would say with the drug testing, we do drug testing at Prairie View. You can bring your son or daughter there. Please make an appointment, and it's $20. But I will also say this. Drug testing is not the consequence. It just tells you what's going on. The consequence still needs to be what are you as a parent going to do. I also have kids, and I work, when I work Federal Bureau of Prison, there's a lot of people who know how to beat a drug test. Just because you have a clean urine analysis doesn't mean necessarily they're not using because people know how to beat that. They use somebody else's urine. They put something in it that alters it. There's many ways that that can happen. Can it be a good tool? Yes. And parents that we have using it currently that just bring their son or daughter in, they call ahead, make the appointment, and then when they pick them up from school, instead of going straight home, they're like, we're going to Prairie View. We're going to have your UA today. So it can be a, to a useful tool if you feel it's necessary. But I would always say don't rely on that because I've had parents who have gone, I know, I know something's going on, but the test comes back negative. And then suddenly there seems to be like a power flip that happens of son and daughter, that son or daughter, and, and that's not what it should be used for as a power tool to get the upper hand, but it can be a help. Some kids will say it helps me, because I can say my mom gets me tested, I can't do this. They might not be strong enough immediately to say no. It might be a good tool, and you might want to sit down and talk to them if you have an addiction issue, if you're having a hard time saying no. We'll drug test you. You can tell your friends every time. They're going to test me, and I don't know when. You know, then it's a, a $20 well worth spent. So it really it has to be a family decision, I believe. If you're doing it through a medical provider, it can become part of their record, and that's fine if that's OK as a parent. But if you choose not to have it part of their medical record, you might want to choose an alternate source to do that. that that's a good point. That was the point I was going to bring up, too. And, and again, the drug test is part of the conversation. If it comes back clean, we've had three clean in a row, this is great. Well, then just a small tool that's part of the ongoing conversation. And as parents in-house, just to throw that in really quickly, uh, I, again, out of our office, uh, chronic pain clinic, we write a lot of scheduled drugs that are often the easiest to get access to in an unsupervised home. Uh, if you're the one with the narcotics, maybe not a narcotic problem, but the drugs that can be abused, in your house, you are responsible for those. I, they shouldn't be in the medicine cabinet anyway. There's too much humidity in there, and that wrecks pills. But narcotics get counted, get tracked. The pharmacy knows where they're at. They can go in the fire safe very easily. It's just a key. They should be under lock and key, just like anything else that would be dangerous for your child at home if you weren't there. Get rid of old prescriptions. Take them down to law enforcement. And there's a box you can drop them in, no questions, no names, just take them and get rid of them. That's the easiest way to make sure they're not available for some. It might not be your child. Mm -hmm. It might be a neighbor. It might be somebody who's mowing for you, walking your dog, cleaning. There's a variety of ways people find pills. That kind of goes along with this question was, how do you get rid of liquid drugs? So I'm assuming it would be, do you take them to the same place you drop off pills? Same place. So if you have some cough medicine with codeine in it, for example, and just make sure it's sealed up nice and tight and bring it down to the police department, the law enforcement center, right in the front desk area, there's a yeah, drop-off container. So. No, I shouldn't. Ideally, no, yeah. No, I wouldn't recommend that. Okay. So back to the talk that we've covered a few times. How early should you talk to your kids about the dangers of drugs and alcohol? What, at what age would be a good starting point? What, what I tell parents is that elementary is not too early, but you don't necessarily have the same talk as you would 
with someone who was a middle school student. We used to do more prevention education in the elementary schools, and we actually had a little refrigerator-like looking board with, and if you have ever been in the grocery store and they have the different kinds of hard mics or the, it's your, what's it called, your dad's root beer? Yeah, I don't know if I was calling it. Whatever the root beer, obviously you can tell I'm not <laughs> buying this. <laughs> but those different things, if I'm a kid and i now in second grade and, or first grade and I can open the refrigerator door, do I know what I'm grabbing? Or if one vitamin tastes good, why not five? So it may be at that elementary level we begin to talk about what's good for in our body and how do you know what's good for in your body, who do you trust to ask and who do you talk to, and why wouldn't we want something in our body that we consider maybe not safe. So you, be, you begin at that elementary level in talking about those pieces. So then uh, that conversation or beginning to talk at middle school about decision making and values and friendships all goes as part of that drug and alcohol talk. It doesn't stand alone. It's part of the tools and skills we help to give our kids. I'm going to bring in something completely different. Um, <clears throat> You also have to have the talk about sex. Um, depending upon how, how mature your student or your kid is, I've had sixth graders who are sexually active. So those kids should have been talked to long before they come to middle school. However, it depends upon your kid. But it's not too early to have the sex talk in elementary school either before they get to middle school. That's a whole different topic, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so kind of related to the talk though, there are a few questions about, is telling my child that if they break the law due to alcohol use or drug use that I will turn them into the police for prosecution okay? Well, that can be one of the consequences that you write in your contract. Absolutely. We have parents that do that. In fact, we just had a young person this last week whose parent searched her room, found the drugs, called law enforcement, and then she went and picked her daughter up and had home and they were waiting for her. That was how she chose to do that. I have also had parents who have argued with me on the phone that the highway patrol should have never had access to the console and I think we're getting an attorney and you know we're fighting this and some of you are rolling your eyes and I was too I'm so glad it was on the phone because <laughs> the the point really being is as John mentioned, what are we teaching? If mo that mom was calling to set up a, an appointment for her child, but as she did so, she told me how she was handling it in her home, which was really, really saying it's okay. That was the message I'm sure the child was getting from it. So I think that's important. And then what could be an appropriate way to tell children about their choice of friends? We're really putting you on the spot tonight, aren't we? <laughs> well, that's a biggie. Um, and Darcy has mentioned that you should know who your friends of your kids are. I had a mother once who came in to me, and she had all of her friends, friends of her kids in a file. You know, she, each kid had an index card, each friend. The parent's name, the parent's address, something about the kid, so that she knew exactly every kid that her son brought home or that he was associating with. That's maybe overkill, but I, I liked it. Um, sometimes if you think your friends are, or your kids are hanging around with the wrong friends, you can tell your kid, you know, I, I'm kind of happy you're hanging around with them because you're going to influence him to have good behavior. So you're affirming your kid. 
when you start to, again, tell them you cannot hang around with that kid, most of the time they'll hang around with that kid. So you have to have some acceptance and some confidence in your kid that he or she may change the behavior of that kid you're not terribly enthused about. Again, it's stock, stacking the odds in your favor. But when you start to deny kids something, especially adolescents, they're going to probably do it anyway. Because, as I said, they want to rebel and they want to get back at you. And they're going to rebel at those things that you're nagging about. One of the things we often do is we have kids write down what they do, how they believe they are a good friend. What do they bring to a friendship? We have them write those things down. And then you can kind of slowly turn that. So the people you're with right now or your friend, you know, do, do they have any of these, these talents, these values? Do they do the same things? And sometimes that's enough for the kids to begin to look at it. Is it going to change everything overnight? I'm not, it's not a magic wand, but it may help them begin to look at those values and what they value as friendship and what they're seeing in that other person. Or if they come home upset with that person, you can start a conversation then. I can understand why you're upset because they lied to you or they took your sweater or they, whatever it might be, and begin to have them <coughs> explore and see for themselves. It's always better if they see it and relay it to you than you to point it out. I think you need to come back next week when we talk about the social media, because that has a big impact on friendships that we see all the time. Okay. How does meth get here from Mexico? Ours. Still highway. Ours. I mean, the reality of the situation, the, the, the cartels down there control everything. And, and, and don't think for one second we don't have people associated with the cartels in Sioux Falls because we do. I mean, it literally comes across the, the border in vehicles. It comes across in backpacks, people on foot, uh, shipping containers, uh, the back of uh, reefer trucks. You know, and it's not like it's coming across a gram or two at a time or a pound or two at a time. These cars are coming across and they've got 25 plus pounds in them. That, that'll go a long ways. You know, and it comes up the interstates, uh, you know, maybe it comes across, uh, you know, for example, the El Paso uh, crossing uh, down in New Mexico. Well, where, let's say it's 50 pounds, where does it go from there? Is it all, you know, going to Las Vegas, let's say, and staying there? Or are people, is it going to Las Vegas and people maybe are, are tripping from Sioux Falls to that location uh, because they have a source in Vegas that they buy from, that source, the sources in Mexico, and they're going to bring five pounds back to Sioux Falls. That's kind of the way it works. So being naive, just can you walk us through the process of, I have a middle schooler. How would they come in contact with drugs? Well, a low-level level dealer. So if I, if I pull a car over, for example, on a Saturday night and make an arrest, and the person has, let's say they've got two grams of methamphetamine on them. If we could track those two grams back to its original source, more than likely it's going to be in Mexico. Well, who sold that person the two grams? Okay, was it a, like a one gram dealer or a guy that's selling quarter ounces? Okay, where does that guy live at? The guy that's selling the half ounces? Does he live in Sioux Falls? Maybe he does. Or does he live in Sioux City? Come to Sioux Falls once a week with a quarter pound and sell it, for example. So, I mean, there, there's a path. I mean, if you could connect the dots, make one of those flow charts with all the people involved, ultimately your source is probably going to be out of the south, so in, in Mexico more than likely. So there's, there's, you know, dealers that are dealing at all different levels. They're selling. Some people are selling grams. Some people are big, a big enough dealer where they're only selling, you know, ounces or, or even pounds. So, you know, a good example is there's a, article in the paper, I can't remember if it was the Argus Leader or on Kello's website. There's a gentleman that was just sentenced uh, last week in federal court here in Sioux Falls for a drug conspiracy. Well, he's got, I think it was three prior felony convictions, 
And he had his opportunity. I know there's a lot of people screaming, you get a life sentence for distribution of methamphetamine. He had his opportunity to, to talk. He chose not to. There was a deal on the table for him if he fully cooperated with the federal government. He chose to take his chances and go to federal court and to trial. He lost. So he's done. And in my opinion, I'm okay with that because when this guy is, is, is dealing in excess of 20 pounds, think of how many people's lives that that one dealer affected over X number of years. Thousands. Thousands. So it's time for this person to go away. He, he should have taken a chance. You know, he should have taken advantage of his one opportunity. He didn't. So case closed. Well. Well, he knows somebody. That person knows somebody. And, that, and that's what I'm talking about with, with, with a flow chart. Everybody knows somebody. So there's certainly, you know, a sixth grader isn't going to have a connection, you know, in a, in a foreign country probably. But, you know, maybe his best friend. And, and how many sixth graders are probably getting arrested with methamphetamine anyway? It, right, and I, and I don't remember, I, and I vaguely remember that particular incident, and I believe that that came from home. So if we've got a, a, a kid in elementary school or middle school that's bringing, you know, depending on what the quantity is of, of marijuana, for example, to school, we're probably look, taking a hard look at those parents because his contacts at that age are going to be pretty minimal, pretty minimal. But if we're talking about a 17-year-old a kid with transportation, he's got his own car, that, that's a little different story. Big, big nice. I've got kids in elementary school, so I, mean, I, know, I, I know how you feel. And we've got a few years left, but there's a big, that's a big step from fifth grade you know, to that middle school age. It's a big step. So even bigger from there to high school. And things only, you know, the things that they're exposed to only get worse, unfortunately. Not better. I, you know, there's really no good answer for it. Conversation, I agree. Know where your kids are. Keep them busy. Keep them occupied. Give them something to do. It's easier said than done. I, I realize that. But The kids that we see at Prairie View, I would say at that younger level, the middle schoolers or fifth graders that we would see, I can't think of one of them that didn't have a sibling or a parent that was using. So it comes from there. With that, though, I will say, and I have done a couple panels in the last few, two months, I guess, with someone who's a recovering meth addict. And one of the things that Tina will say is, the person who introduces you to meth is usually someone I know, I thought I could trust, and somebody I was comfortable with. And I think that's that piece that we need to understand is that as your kids move into that middle school and high school, staying connected with who those friends are. And trust your gut. If it's like, this kid doesn't seem right, talk about it. Talk about why it doesn't seem right, and then think, how am I going to talk to my son or daughter about that? What can we do to change that? Because it's typically someone they know. You, you don't have a dealer come up to you, a sixth grader on the street, and say, hey, do you want to buy? That just doesn't happen. It has to be there's a connection. I often think of meth as the connection drug because there's always a network involved. 
Well, with that, um, I think that ends this night on a, a good ending. So I want to thank our panel again so much for their time and expertise tonight. <laughs> And as, as John mentioned, next week, um, Thursday evening, we will be covering social media and internet and have a panel for that too. So I hope to see you back next week and thank you for coming. There's brochures in the back on the right hand or left hand side.